Hey guys, it's Rachel here, and it was recently suggested to me that maybe I could share my story as a way to um, uh, not only help others, but to also be vulnerable. So I have a tendency to keep my life pretty private as a defense mechanism um, and to protect my heart. And I have recently discovered that that maybe hasn't served me very well. Um, it seemed to. <laughs> um, but I've missed out on a lot by not sharing my heart with others. This is my recovery story. My recovery story. Here it goes. So, when I was 17, I started drinking as a way to um, get back at my dad. I was angry with my dad for his drinking. That's when I started uh, drinking myself. Um, and I went all in. So like I drank a lot whenever I did drink. So from the age of 17 to 21, drinking became my sole focus in life. I, um, if you weren't drinking, then you probably weren't a part of my life. It kept me from making, having friendships. It uh, removed friendships from my life. So that just became my sole focus in life. Then I met the man that would later become my husband. He was active in his addiction and I was an alcoholic and it didn't work our relationship didn't work so we eventually agreed to quit using um, each of our substances so that our relationship could work and eventually that did happen dated then got married and for 10 years I didn't drink at all but that was the only thing that had changed my behaviors hadn't changed um, I unknowingly had just made my my spouse my uh, sole focus and higher power. Whereas alcohol had been my only only way to connect with people, now um, now my husband was my only way that I connected with people. Um, I let my husband be that connection for everybody. Uh, even my connection with God uh, came through my husband. It just seemed that he already had a connection with God. And I knew God with my head, but not with my heart. And so I just let my husband take on that relationship for the both of us and just figured that was the way it was going to be. Then in 2012, I uh, decided to give drinking another shot. You know, maybe I didn't have a problem with drinking and everything was fine and I had just villainized alcohol. From the outside, that probably seemed successful to everybody around, but internally, I was pretty obsessive about drinking and had a uh, a lot, exerted a lot of my control over it. I had rules for when I could and could not drink. I was obsessively worried about drinking too much. Um, the occasions where I did have a little bit too much to drink felt uh, a lot of guilt and shame um, about those instances and I still do when I think back on them. And the biggest thing was that I uh, then started using alcohol as a way to connect with people again. So if there was a function without alcohol, it was just, uh, I just dreaded it um, and didn't know what to do. Uh, but if I had alcohol present, then everything seemed fine. Around 2014, 2015, I didn't know it at the time, but I was blessed with the discovery of some autoimmune disorders. Well, I didn't discover them at that time, but the discovery of, uh, that I could get those to go into remission by changing my diet. And that change in my diet was really radical um, and included alcohol. For a while, I tried to um, make alcohol a part of my new diet. Try gluten-free beer, um, wine, natural wine, uh, just straight high-quality liquor, thinking it had the least amount of additives. But no matter what I tried, um, it just it wouldn't work. It couldn't. And I was so mad at God. So, so mad and told God, you know, not only can I not eat things that most other people can eat, now I can't have alcohol and all this on top of not being able to have children. And I thought it was so unfair and I was so mad about it and carried that, that uh, anger around with me. Um, even if I pushed it to the side, in daily life, it was it was there. Fortunately, God, you know, didn't listen to what I wanted. And then I say fortunately because then in 2016, my life uh, completely and utterly fell apart all around me. 
if I would have had alcohol as an option in my life, uh, how that time was handled would be very, very different. But I didn't have that option. Gratefully, so thankful that I didn't. But I didn't have any other tools either. So I was left pretty alone and not knowing what to do. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have a strong connection with God. I knew God with my head. You know, I knew why I believed what I believed. If you, if you ask me, I can, could write you a report on it. <laughs> but I didn't know with my heart. And when your life kind of falls apart all around you, if you don't have that heart connection with God, life's pretty, pretty difficult. And I didn't have anybody around me. I had spent a lifetime of keeping my heart guarded. And I should point out that um, I was uh, living my life like a Christian. You know, I was doing all the things that good Christians do, but I hadn't given God my heart. Now I can see that without my heart, those things weren't having, weren't as edifying as, as what they could be. It seems that God wants does want my heart first and foremost. So yeah, 2016, I was alone, life had fallen apart, I was overwhelmed, I felt hopeless. It all culminated into two choices, death or change. Being so overwhelmed, I came close to choosing death, closer than I ever had been before. Whereas before death, you know, with not being able to have children, it was just something I kind of welcomed in my life. Now it was something where it seemed like a, like a choice I could make. But I had a small amount of faith, and that's what kept me alive. Because I knew if I killed myself, I'd still be in the same situation. Just completely aware of what I had just done, and standing in front of my Creator. So, then that, uh, I chose life. Or at this point, you could just say I didn't choose death which means I had to choose something else, which was change. So I just kept doing the next right thing. Uh, one day I picked up the big book from Alcoholics Anonymous to read it to support a loved one in my life who was struggling with addiction. I just kept reading it and just kept seeing myself in it. It took some time for me to admit that that was true. I was seeing myself in it. Uh, I was in denial for a while, and but eventually, like, God put it on my heart, and I couldn't get away from it. That was myself that I was seeing. So I finally came to a point where I could accept and admit that I was an alcoholic. I just hadn't reached the same lows and rock bottoms that others had. God knows my, my unchanged behavior had certainly led me to to the brink, so my low just looks, uh, came to it a little bit differently maybe than some others. So I finally admitted it to myself and um, worked those first three steps and then I got stuck. At this point I had been attending um, an AA meeting once a week and uh, with a loved one. I just told God, like my life was so crazy, I was so overwhelmed and I said, you know, I can't handle this right now. I need, I don't know how to move forward. I clearly need a sponsor and I don't know how I'm going to find one. So I don't talk to people. I don't know how to talk to people and gatherings and social situations. So I told God that he was going to have to help me. And um, God did. <laughs> My sponsor found me. Started working the 12 steps and I've made it through the 12 steps. Um, I still have work to do around step nine, but um, that's like an ongoing thing. This is the hardest thing that I've ever done. Um, I cannot believe how incredibly hard and difficult this is. I never like would have thought becoming a better person could be so difficult, but it is. It feels like there's this like black substance that's just all over me, like all over the very core of me that's holding me back from becoming a better person. And every time I try to like climb out of this hole, it just like grabs me and drags me back down. Um, but I make progress forward every time, like I'm up higher out of the hole or I get further away from the hole before I get dragged in. Um, or drag backwards again. So it's definitely two steps forward, one step back, or any variation of that. 
but um, consistently, utterly the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life. The result of, of doing this really hard work is that um, I have had glimpses of joy and serenity that I never had in my life before. And I didn't know that this even existed. <laughs> I All of a sudden I was like, oh, I know why people want to be alive or are okay with being alive. Because if you had like these glimpses of true joy and true serenity, oh my goodness, like that's where it's at. I had no idea. And so because of those glimpses, I feel like I can move forward and I can move on and continue working. Still fall into old behaviors. Um, sometimes things happen and my initial reaction is, is I wish I wasn't alive. Um, but now I recognize that as an old behavior and I can ask for strength. Still working in my heart connection with God. Sometimes it feels like he's not there and I question everything. But I remember like the fruit of this hard work that I've put in. I just keep moving forward. So the fruit in my life has been brought about by my hard work. <laughs> can't say my hard work. But I have done hard work, but with God's help. And it's fully 100% admitting that I'm powerless, just in general, across the board. Turning my life and my will over to God. And honesty, rigorous honesty, especially with myself. That hard work has been fruitful and brought glimpses of joy and serenity, albeit very limited. But I have a strong, confident hope that I can have more joy and serenity in my life because, you know, I look around and I, throughout my life, I've seen people with this joy just emanating from their very being and I just never understood. I just didn't get it. And like, were they faking? Was it real? Like, and you know, some people, you you know, like they're not faking. Like this is, this is, it's, it seems real. And I just, I didn't know, like, I was like, how? I don't understand. And I feel like now I have the tools to maybe someday be in that position where I can have that same joy emanating for me. And I have this strong and confident hope that it can happen because I see people with this joy at AA meetings. Um, I see this a lot with people in the religious life. Um, my hope is that that can be me someday. I can be joyful. In order to do that, I can't do keep doing the same thing I was doing before. So keep doing the hard work. And then I think God keeps telling me that um, I'm gonna have to be vulnerable. Uh, so this video is an effort um, to be vulnerable. Yeah, so that's my recovery story. I don't think I have anything else to say. I just want a life of love and joy. I want to love people without like thinking of myself first and without being defensive. <laughs> it's just so crazy uh, just to say a little bit more. I had no idea like that joy and serenity when I had glimpses of joy and serenity I can't even pick out the moments like I couldn't tell you an exact instance. Oh but I remember what it felt like and I just had, didn't have it in my life before. I had like you know, happiness. I had like external, like caused by external circumstances, happiness and peace in my life. But it was not worth the life I was living. Um, it wasn't worth the uh, the suffering that I had in my life too. Like the those periods of of happiness and peace were. I would totally just give those up not to have, not to experience the suffering I had in my life. Yeah, I just didn't know that the, the, those, that true joy and serenity that comes from God, um, what it was, like it was just overwhelming, so.